Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 107 for Monday, September 21st, 2020. My name is Joel Duggan, and this week we are one pixel short. Johnny is away for the week, but filling in is Stunt Pixel. Friend of the show, Whip, is here. Hello, and welcome back, my friend. Hey, Joel, how you doing? Happy, happy to be back here. I'm always happy to sit around, as I mentioned, just geek about Minecraft for a little bit. I mean... Usually people get, can't get me to shut up about the game. So now I just get to talk about it for an hour. This is great. Exactly. And that's something that we've found uh, common with our guests. It's usually like, yes, I'd love to talk about Minecraft for an hour and a half. Oh, no, I just need to find the time to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All of us that content is a creators very true are so statement. busy, right? Um, before we get going, just in case, because it has been a little while since you've been on the show, we have a number of new listeners. Where can people like go to find your work and find what you're doing online with Minecraft? Yeah, so I do YouTube primarily, just F-W-H-I-P, and then also on Twitch, it's the same exact name over there, so keeping it simple now. Fine, I think actually since the last time on the show, pretty much all my platforms I've gotten my actual name on, so that that's some big news. <laughs> Consistency across social networks is really key. It makes it really easy for you know you to plug something or for people to find you intuitively. You know, like I I mean I'm old enough to not have like an online handle. I use my real name, but it just means that when I'm plugging stuff on different shows or plugging stuff on my on my um my streams, I'm just like I'm just Joel Duggan everywhere. Do, depending on where and what kind of content you want, just look for my name, and I will more than likely just show up. Mm -hmm. I think the only place where there's a little confusion, if you're looking for photography, there's a Joel Duggan photographer in the US that's a professional and I'm pretty sure he's got the Flickr account. And so people are just like, is this you? Nope, not me. It's the one person that's not me. Everybody else, <laughs> the all the other time. Joel Duggans are me. Um, just, I'm not bitter about it. Not no, at all. Not, not bitter. All. <laughs> well, speaking about bitter, uh, if you want to hear a little bit about <laughs> fires on the West Coast, uh, hiking and sidewalk etiquette then you can head over to patreon.com slash the spawn chunks and listen to the render distance it's the pre-show and post-show conversation that we have with uh ourselves and our guests whenever we have one each week and uh, it's available to patrons at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks uh as per tradition when we do our quick login and find out where we have been and what we have been doing in minecraft this week the guest goes first so whip what have you been up to in minecraft as of late so I decided to start another stupidly large project. I feel like I'm becoming <laughs> famous for those at this point in time. You and Pixar uh, have it, like a tennis match going on. It's just yeah, <laughs> I, I'm one up and I'm one upping him on this one of my <laughs> Nether Hub, which is actually currently I'm sitting AFK in my Minecraft world on another monitor, uh, watching a little TNT machine go by exploding the Nether. So I've been doing that. I've uh, found a 3D quarry de design by Raiseworks which is amazing. You just build it in a corner of this whole area that you want to clear out, and it just goes and clears the entire thing. It takes a few hours. But so I've been doing that. I've been doing some interiors, decorating interiors for once, because I never do those. Um, and then trying to not die in modded Minecraft. <laughs> it's, been, it's been an eventful little while. I'm actually really glad that we have you on the show this week because um, what you've been up to lately really just kind of hap by pure happenstance lines up with a number of emails that we have later on uh, during the, the, the render distance. So tell me more about the, the Raiseworks, like, um, is it a flying machine miner thing? Like, is this how, is this how you're creating another? Yeah, it's one of those flying machine TNT duplicator magic things that I don't know actually how it works in reality. I just knew how to follow a tutorial and build it. Uh, but it's these slime blocks that get pushed, these flying machines with the TNT things on it. So that gets pushed across in a line. And then it basically has these gloves on either side that catch it and move it one block over and redirect it and send it back down the other way. Then the other side catches it, moves it one block further down and sends it back. So slowly it just works its way across to everything from like start to finish of whatever giant pit you're trying to clear out. It'll just slowly clear everything it was so simple to build i unfortunately because i'm working in the nether we have the bedrock ceiling i had to clear the top 10 blocks across the entire area which right. took about five shulker boxes full of tnt to do and then after that thankfully i just set this thing up and i'm just on lava patrol making sure i clear up all the lava sources so i don't have to deal with like those crazy things because i'll stop the tnt from moving blocks but other than that i just get to sit here and watch this thing destroy everything so Wow. That's, are you recording it? Like, are you going to do like a time lapse for one of your videos? Yeah, I just, I believe who I tried it the first time and I was just like, all right, here's four hours of me destroying the whole thing. And it goes so fast. 
or I had to chunk <laughs> it down to be so small to make it actually look worthwhile that you couldn't see the TNT falling out of it. Right. So you just saw the land disappearing, which was kind of cool, but I, I don't know. Yeah, we'll, people have seen that we'll before. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I, uh, I haven't crossed the threshold of the TNT duping machine yet on the Citadel. Um, I have a concrete maker that would have made use of one because it's a it's a mumbo jumbo design, uh, but I decided to tweak it and only use manual crafted TNT on the server just because I was building it and I hadn't consulted other members on the server and I was like I don't know if anybody's going to really have a problem with this I not sure if I do I'd like to try it at least uh, the old fashioned way to see just how much sand and TNT this actually eats up. Um, and it turns out it wasn't as bad as I thought. So I decided not to go with the TNT duper. Um, but if I can see when you're clearing large areas like that, though, um, for time constraints, it would just make sense to have some sort of TNT, you know, duplicating machine or, or something to make things just a little bit easier. Yeah, especially when it's yeah. on a machine that's traveling, right? Because my, mm -hmm. my TNT um, concrete maker is static. I just, I can always refill it because it's always in the same place. But chasing down a flying machine to refill it would be, a pain in the butt yeah i'm not i don't even know if you can move a dispenser that would be able to drop this stuff I, maybe at bedrock because i think you can move uh -huh. tile storage entities but i don't think you could do that even in java so i think this might be the only way i spent about 10 hours clearing the top layer just because of the size of this dang thing um it's about 600 blocks long and 400 blocks wide at this point or maybe even longer um because i'm trying to fit a gold farm and i'm trying to fit a wither skeleton farm inside of it inside so i had to clear house. all the land and then i have to mob proof all of it and are you a fan of the elder scrolls games i remember uh, that correctly i i like them i've not played them very much mostly just because i missed that kind of opportunity i was more, okay. into, more into warcraft uh yeah i've seen them played and i and i from what little i played i really enjoyed the story I'm just not much of a first person melee person. Like I, yeah, that, no, that's that, that's, that's, that's me is kind of, what, but everything about them in terms of the world and the, how they look and stuff like that was awesome. You know, like walking. Yeah. Around. I was going to say for then for the viewers then um, is the idea that I'm going with off of creating this whole thing is there's a zone inside of Skyrim called black reach, which is this giant underground cavern that's in this old ancient dwarven, type architecture down there but it's this huge cavern with bioluminescent glowing mushrooms all over the place oh cool and just this huge massive open cavern so i'm trying to create some my own version of that as my nether hub so we'll we'll see how the project goes <laughs> did you gonna... did you choose a soul sand valley for the for the location I'm... Unfortunately, there is a lot of Soul Sand Valley in here, so there is a lot of gas flying around. Uh, on my screen right now, looking at the side <laughs> monitor, I currently see seven. So, <laughs> the, I'm I'm currently I put myself in a glass box and I just sit there when they can't see through glass. Thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> so th well that'll work out well because you'll have that blue haze, like the blue mm -hmm. fog from the Soul Sand Valley. I never, yeah. you know, I I haven't thought much about building in the Nether. Um, for a reason actually we'll get into a little bit later but using the different biomes for different atmospheric effects you know like if you wanted to do some really cool post-apocalyptic scene if it didn't matter that you were in the nether or if, or if you couldn't tell that you were in the nether if you built that in like a um what's it called the the basalt delta basalt the delta yeah. like with all the delta was the name flying I around remember. yeah so if you if you were in the basalt delta and you had all the all the um all the particles flying around then that would be really cool for like an ashen wasteland you know mm -hmm. creating making your own volcano in that biome would be really neat and yeah, it's it's amazing it's too bad that those things all seem to be biome related as opposed to accumulation of blocks because it would be really neat to be able to take a bunch of the basalt delta blocks and put them in the overworld. And then if you had enough of them together, create that same atmosphere again, like get that mm -hmm. ash, you know, uh, overlay, which would be really cool. So I'm not sure if, I don't know if there's any data packs that'll do that. If you can do that kind of thing where you can change the, the atmosphere color, you know, in certain biomes, like if you wanted swamps to be like green, foggy and misty and gross and all that kind of stuff, that would be really cool. I know with Optifine, you can add that type of a glow to places with like through a texture pack optifine can allow for like biome specific coloring and stuff so you can add like a little bit of a haze to it oh cool i know you could do but, that with grass and leaf textures i didn't know you could do it with yeah with the glow because you can change the sky texture and that can change a lot of the atmosphere and then right. i think you can 
change like the vignette overlay that you have i think you can kind of tint that as well for bio that would be Uh, that'd be a cool idea actually that might be worth looking into outside of that i think it might just be world edit because you'd have to actually set the biome because everything's tied to that or you're running command blocks to create particles constantly (laughs) which is uh (laughs) any experience with particles in minecraft is uh i try and avoid them (laughs) yeah yeah let's not go down that performance rabbit hole um oh god speaking of for me uh, i've been spending uh, a little bit more time in modded minecraft Uh, i uh, am working my way slowly through the tech reborn mod in the all of fabric 3 mod pack and i'm not really exploring many of the other mods uh anything that has to do with mining like digus maximus uh or any kind of ui things like a pocket crafting table a mini map i'm using those on the regular uh, vanilla hammers, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm basically trying to make the experience as, as modded as I can, but I'm quickly finding that all of Fabric 3, it's I w- it's not vanilla plus because it definitely has mods in it and, and that w- that changed the game, but it feels vanilla gated in terms like of just redstone or enchantment or like how, uh, or diamond gating like th- or iron gating. There just seems to be this like, need for these things where it's like well i i don't want to just mine for hours and hours and hours and hours i do that on my vanilla playthrough i don't want to do it here um and i also don't want to make just an iron golem farm because like i i would kind of want to find another way to do things and that's what i like so much about the tech reborn thing Uh, have you done much for modded in terms of like tech mods i know you're playing on a modded server right now uh the x life server is the only modded experience i've ever had and we are pretty vanilla on Mm. all of it it's mostly just adding blocks and decorative things right the mod that we the most technical mod that we have like as far as auto producing things is called tiny mob farms you basically make these mob farms and you can put a mob in a lasso and you put it inside the farm and each time the farm will tick it'll take durability off the lasso and basically until that hits zero you're producing mob loot from it so like you can put a wither skeleton inside of there and you can get like wither skeleton skulls out of it stuff like right. that right so it sounds, but sounds as, like a mod pack for builders right yeah it's very much vanilla focused yeah. as <laughs> keeping it about as friendly as we can nice no that's cool though because uh, because the one that i the mod pack that i dove into just kind of head first is it seems to be pretty tech related because there's not a lot of blocks added to the game uh there are a lot of biomes so i enjoy exploring because there's a lot of really neat looking biomes specifically biomes that are added to go in between biomes so you'll have a swamp like a vanilla swamp and you'll have a forest which is vanilla but then you'll have like a swampy forest or a marshland so the transition from one biome to the next it's almost seamless like you can see them on the map clear as day but when you're walking through them in the world it feels very natural to go from lots of water to just a little bit less to like these little pockets of water and then you're in grasslands and it just it, that's really cool yeah it really feels cool you should check it out it's um uh ecotunes is one of them uh and terrestria is the other terrestria i think is the one that handles a lot of the more a lot of the biomes um but it's really really fun stuff uh, one of the other mods uh or i guess section of a mod that i uh, get into this week was um, I wanted to get into enchanting. Like I'm trying to going through my vanilla checkboxes. Like what's holding me back? It's like, well, I don't have a silk touch pick. And so I wasn't able to do a lot with glass. I can't really build the way that I want to because I'm just kind of constantly stuck. And so uh, I was heading for enchanting and I was looking for um, sugar cane for paper. Couldn't find it anywhere. So I thought, okay, this is nuts. There has, there has to be a non vanilla way to get paper in this mod. And sure enough, I was at the the point in Tech Reborn where creating a sawmill wasn't really outside of my wheelhouse. It was actually about, about the same tech level that I should be. And what was really nice about this is that it gives you sawdust, paper, and planks. Uh, it costs you technology and research. So you have to kind of go through the, the grind. And I don't want to say grind because it's an interesting tech tree to get there. But once you're there, instead of just turning logs into planks, or instead of growing sugarcane and getting paper, you get all three from the same log. So you still get four planks, you get some sawdust, and you get some paper. And it's not a lot. It's like one, maybe two pieces of paper, because I think it might be like random. Uh, hmm. But it all happens fueled by energy, and I have a solar panel. So like I didn't have to 
smelt anything. I didn't have to build a big redstone farm for sugar cane, which I think everybody's done a hundred times. And so it was this really cool way to get enough paper for the books to then craft um, the bookcases I need for enchanting. And the other uh, small mod that was in there, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's just called another flesh mod, but it basically just takes flesh, uh, rotten flesh from zombies. You have to combine five of them in an X on the crafting table. And that gives you compressed flesh, which you can then smelt in a smoker specifically, not any other furnace, has to be a smoker into leather. So you can use zombie flesh, which you have a lot of at this point, um, or I have a zombie spawner underneath my main house. So I was able to get leather for the books in an alternate way than just cow farm, you know? So I'm so surprised turning rotten flesh into leather isn't in the base game. I feel like rotten flesh is one of those things that's just like, unless you're trading with a cleric, it's pretty worthless. There's yeah. There's really nothing for it. And even then, you have to trade so much of it with a cleric. Like, mm -hmm. it's like 36 or 32. It's not like it's it's low numbers. You go through a, a chest of it very quickly for a half a dozen emeralds. Uh, well, maybe not a half a dozen, but like, you know, very few. Um, and, and I agree. Uh, and I, I've actually had a data pack on the Citadel for ages. That's just a straight up, you know, one-to-one -one cook rotten flesh. You get leather in any furnace, like just do it however you want. And uh, I was looking for that. And I found it a little bit more creative in, in um, all of Fabric 3 that it was there. It was a little bit more work. And I actually don't mind that it was a little bit more work. Because uh, it makes it makes sense, I guess, thematically, that rotten flesh just doesn't magically turn into leather. You kind of had to stitch a bunch together, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of make your thing. So, um, so I, I had <laughs> I have bookshelves now made up of basically the Necromon uh, Necromonicon <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from from uh, Evil Dead, uh, and I still wasn't able to get my um, my Silk Touch because the one enchantment that we got was like Unbreaking, and I think Sharpness or something were the two that I chose for my first couple enchants. But my zombie spawner, even though it's it's right there, it's still slow, uh, and it's early game XP. So I just I'm so used to used to and so spoiled by like the Ender Ender that we have on the Citadel, and where you can get up to like level thirty in about five minutes. And this, mm -mm, no, this was like okay, I can't do this on stream. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to do a little bit of work, I think, in between streams before I get back up mm -hmm. to to doing that. Um, yeah, we uh, we have this mod on ours called Apotheosis which brings okay. this enchantment into the game. If you can get it on there, it's insane. It allows you to move spawners around. So if you find a bunch of spawners, you can move, like I move five zombie spawners together, and then there's <laughs> ways to enhance them to basically make them constantly spawning mobs. So I have five zombie spawners that spawn 15 to 20 zombies each, and they do that about every five seconds. And so that's that's more than you can really ever need. And then there's also on top of that, of course, there is is there's an enchant you can get called Knowledge of the Ages, which the mod adds in the game that basically turns all mob drops directly into experience. Wow. And so it's just like I can get on an, on the X Life server, I can get myself from level zero to level three hundred in about four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it just completely broke everything, but yeah. it's it's great. And now I can sell my experience services to everybody else on the server. But when when you're doing stuff like that though, like when you're on a, a server that's of builders and people are end game most of the time, like you just you're just kind of saving yourselves a lot of time in grind work that you don't necessarily want to do, right? Our concept behind the server is it's called X Life because you have ten lives. So if you die ten times, you are banned from the server. So Okay. We you you really and each so your first life you have one heart, then you die, you come back, you have two hearts, you die, three hearts, et cetera, until you get to ten hearts. And then you die again, you are you're kicked out. <laughs> so getting the strong chance and everything early on was uh, very important. <laughs> yeah, that would help balance things off and, and make sure people don't like get kicked off the server like too quickly where it's not fun. Yeah, we have um, right now the server's been live for about three months, four months at this point in time. And we have one or two people that are nearing to being out. I don't know their exact hearts where their video releases are at this time. So I don't want to spoil anything. Right. Uh, but they are uh, <laughs> headed in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably be me because I'm just so used to endgame and feeling indestructible and death not having much for consequences that I would probably just die. I would jump off of something five blocks high and die going like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, my, I, uh, my first two lives, I survived 38 minutes and was killed by a crocodile. Didn't know they spawned on top of mountains, but they do. <laughs> uh, and then I survived. Then, unfortunately, my house was on top of said mountain. The crocodile and I killed each other. 
uh, when we di when I died. So, you know, at least I didn't go down alone. And then I spawned back and I was doing my stuff, chopping a tree down and another crocodile comes up behind me and I survived eight minutes on two hearts. So uh, I really started off a little rough on that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that would that would make you nervous from the get go for sure. Yeah, it was a it was a little rough. I was like, all right, I'm going to last three weeks on this series. Got it. That's how this is going to go. <laughs> Uh, after I finished with my modded stuff, uh, I actually had some problems with fabric not working at all. So I was like, all right, well, I would like to just go back and play Minecraft for this weekend. So I ended up popping back onto the Citadel for the first time in a long time. I found an older version of Optifine that allowed me to play without too much discomfort, which is nice. Um, and I have taken a page out of your book, sir, and I have now broken ground on the medieval fantasy district uh, on the Citadel uh, or realm, I guess is what we're calling it. And basically what this is, it's, it's 9,000 blocks away from the main area on the Citadel. And uh, we use command block teleport, teleporting uh, to get there. And it kind of, we've kind of RP'd it into like a tiny uh, portal that you can go through. Um, but uh, cool. yeah, uh, so it just, it's going to give us the ability to build in different styles across the server without l having to start over again. So you've got end game, but it's also far enough that you kind of want to bring everything with you and it's going to be, better to kind of like have the farms and have some of the mines there because it's just gonna be too mm -hmm. much of a pain in the butt to travel back and forth um right now we're not charging for it but i think what we want to do is come up with a way to have the portal to certain areas cost i don't know emeralds diamonds something probably diamonds um so that you're not just constantly popping back and forth to your inventory like it's more about like bring what you can with you and then kind of like go from there um, and, uh, so I built a bridge just kind of like from the cuff on stream on the weekend. And I'm really happy with the way it came out. It's just a simple stone bridge. The walking part is only three blocks wide, but it's asymmetrical. Actually, I think I saw that on Twitter. That looked really nice. Thanks, man. I, I will, from nice you, sir, I will take that bridge. compliment. <laughs> I Something about that. just like a nice little cobblestone-y mossy stone bridge just over a river. I, I love them. They're it, the simpler, the better on those for me. I, yeah. They, they don't need to be crazy. And that's what I was going for. Cause this is basically like, I wanted to establish like a path and just trying to get like that. I know you talk about this in your videos all the time, that path of the eye traveling through this area. Cause there's some mountains and there's a village and there's a forest. And I kind of wanted to kind of like guide our server members and the, any other people that end up seeing it. Um, along this path and there's obviously a river in the way like all right well this is where i want the path to go so that means there has to be a bridge and it, i made this asymmetrical bridge because one part of the river is or one part of the land is quite high compared to the other so like a taiga forest compared to a plains biome so the bridge oh, starts yeah. in the taiga high and then ends low uh in the um in the uh in the plains biome so i kind of had to make like an egg shape to it and mm -hmm. for a first go, I was actually like, this actually worked out pretty well. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And um, I was, this is the first time I've been back on the Citadel server in a couple of weeks. And the first time that I've been playing vanilla Minecraft in at least a week and a half because I was playing mostly modded. And the things that I missed from modded were not the tech stuff and it wasn't the new blocks. I was still jonesing for things like crack slabs and mossy stairs. Um, which I've been talking about for two years. Um, but, as we all. Yeah. As we all yeah. <laughs> So say we all, right? This is the way. Um, but for me, it was, um, I really would have liked a mini map to the point where I might actually talk to members on the server and say like, hey, would you guys, how would you feel about everybody having access to a mini map mod? Uh, we would just agree on the one that we wanted to use because it would, it would help me so much as a builder to plan out the area. Uh, mm -hmm. and I know I could use Minecraft maps, but you're just constantly updating them and you can't carry them with you, uh, to the point where they're usable. So yeah, it's a little hard to be like, Oh, where's this? All right. I'm on map two C. Okay. Yeah, where's that in my inventory? Exactly. Okay, oh, that's three D. Okay. Never mind. Exactly. And so I'd love to be able to use a map, especially if it became a way for us to add waypoints that other people could access. Not that it would be used for teleportation, but because it would be used for, I'm new to the area. Where the heck is the inn? Like where the heck is the coal mine? Like, how do I find this stuff? Mm -hmm. And, and that would be very helpful, I think. Um, but really for me, it was more about planning the flow of the road and thinking like, oh gosh, I'm definitely missing that mini map. I'm guilty as charged. Right. 
Um, that and when I was building this path through the Taiga Forest and I had to have like two shulker boxes and an entire inventory worth of block selection on me, I really, really wanted that crafting table in my pocket. Like <laughs> it was such a pain in the butt to go back to a crafting table every time I needed more stairs or more slabs or anything like that. So those little things that I feel don't really change the core Minecraft gameplay, like they just kind of like add a little bit to it. I might actually consider talking with the Citadel people and saying like, hey, look, why don't we play a little bit? And maybe we only limit it to like, hey, when you're in this new area, this new medieval fantasy realm, which is huge, use the map mod. Mm -hmm. And then when you're not, don't use it. And we can just kind of go on the honor system or something like that. Just because I think it could be a fun experiment. Um, do you guys have anything like that on on the, the server that you're playing on? Do you have like m maps or anything? Yeah, we have mini maps and all that stuff. Pretty much the whole thing. We actually don't have the crafting, like the crafting table and the inventory type thing. But we do have what has made me desperately want a Minecraft inventory update. Is we have these backpacks that you can create that you can just carry in inventory and weirdly enough, you can put backpacks inside of backpacks, but it's just like, it's like a, it's probably like a 20 by 15 just tiles of inventories. They're just massive. Mm. And so I have a storage room, but it's mostly decorative because everything I got, you can build an ender chest backpack. And then I just filled that full of 27 different backpacks in there. That one is all my terraforming stuff. One's all of like random decoration bits and right. one's like maybe mob drops. And so like. I just carry all that with me and that like is just and then I log back into my single player world that's just vanilla survival. I'm like, oh, I here's my 70 shulker boxes that I <laughs> call a mobile storage system. All right, that's uh that's nice because I am a uh, my shulker box collection just keeps growing and growing and growing and it's it's so bad. I, I've crafted over three hundred shulker boxes and they're all full of random stuff oh, wow. scattered around my world. I don't know where they are. They're doing something and I I'm always losing resources. I have a lot, but it's not 300. That's for sure. I, I, I certainly have more than I can carry in an ender chest and, and my inventory like combined. Uh, and so I have to choose which ones I want to take with me. And then other times I have ones that are like full of really valuable stuff like iron. And it's like the whole thing is just iron blocks. Like I really don't want to lose this <laughs> so, or mm -hmm. misplace it, you know, so I don't carry yeah. it on my person that much, but. Um, well, we should probably move on into the news, and it is going to be a light news week, as you would expect, seeing as we're only a couple of weeks away from Minecraft Live. I don't anticipate there being a lot of news uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but this was actually sent to me over Discord uh, from Pixel Riffs over the weekend before he had to uh, scoot off to take care of the family stuff. Uh, and that is the Play Minecraft Dungeons with Touch Controls article on Xbox.com. Uh, available starting September 15th, 2020, in 22 countries, you can play Minecraft Dungeons with touch controls on your Android mobile phone or tablet with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and xCloud. xCloud release will have fully optimized native touch controls and redesigned UI to make it easy to navigate the inventory or the in-game menu on a smaller screen. With Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, players can jump on their mobile device and play online co-op with their friends on Xbox One. Crossplay to PC is coming later this year. And Minecraft Dungeons September Update, a tour on Minecraft.net. This was originally published on September 9th. Uh, I think we were focused mostly on the release of the Creeping Winter DLC the week that this came out. Uh, but if you're needing a refresher on what's new in Minecraft Dungeons, this article will run you through the village slash camp, daily trials, and new content, artifacts, enchantments, and gear. And it seems to be a fairly poignant article. It's like right down to the brass tacks. They don't seem to mess around a lot. There's not a lot of fluff. Uh, I reviewed about half of it before I, I started the show today. And uh, I would highly recommend it if you are like me and you haven't been in Minecraft Dungeons in a little while. It kind of gives you the nuts and bolts about what to expect with uh, the free content. Uh, so not focusing on the Creeping Winter, but focusing on originally the, the, the free update that, that is available to everybody. And then also when they get into the Creeping Winter, they talk about things like the artifacts and then the enchantments that are uh, specific to that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm wondering if the developments on Minecraft Dungeons on mobile will spill over into co-op or couch co-op specifically, because I know Johnny had some criticisms of two-player inventory issues when he was talking about that experience. Uh, I know that you play some dungeons from time to time, Whip. Have you had any experience with like couch co-op or has your co-op experience always been online? 
It's always been online with just people throughout because I just have it on my computer. Right. But I, I honestly, I haven't played Dungeons since the initial hype of it being released. I kind of, I really love to play these dungeon crawler type games of I just go super hard in them. I go all the way until I literally hit a wall that I can't beat. And on Dungeons, I, I didn't, I never hit that wall. I went all the way through the hardest difficulty, the max you could go out and beat the final boss. And I was like, all right, cool. Uh, now what? <laughs> and then, so I, I honestly, I haven't played it since the initial release too much, but I was just kind of scrolling through that tour one that you're talking that you just linked in the that you're talking about and there's so many new merchants yes i yeah. really want to go jump in there <laughs> yeah there's new merchants you can do things like uh respec your uh, your enchants you can um you can trade i can't remember what his, what his name is he's the uh, i can't remember the name of the villager but you can trade items between players now so if yeah you the I, gift wrapper gift wrapper thank you yeah like if you and i were doing co-op and i picked up a bow that you wanted and you had an axe that i wanted for a fee we could you know in-game fee like in-game currency we could we could trade you know you could give it to me uh which is really cool I, and great for for bringing people in you know yeah i remember being so frustrated by that just mm -hmm. working with other people and playing with them and just doing things and me being like, all right, I have all this great gear that I guess really cool and I like it. And then I would bring a friend in because they'd be like, oh, I want to check out this game. Let's go play and play for a little bit and be like, all right, cool. Here's all this stuff. And I'm like, my character's maxed out. I had one of every single legendary that you could get in the initial release. And then I would get something cool to drop and be like, oh, it's a duplicate. All right. Oh, well, and I can't give it to you. So that's really cool to see that they changed that. I'm. That makes me really want to check the game out again. Yeah. So did you pay for the DLC? Like, did you get the hero edition or did you just get the base? Yes, I got I got the hero and all that stuff. Right. So you so did, have you gone through the Jungle Awakens and the Creeping Winter DLC? Or? I have not. Oh, okay. So I you do just... have new levels available to you then. The, yeah. Uh, as well as the daily trials too, right? Because if you're at Endgame, then the daily trials are supposed to be like this, what do Endgame players do when they have the best mm -hmm. of everything? Because the gear there is supposed to be even better because of the restrictions that they put on you. So... Um, I, I have the opposite problem. I could not beat, well, I shouldn't say that. I tried twice and through a couple of glitches and some unfortunate luck, I just did not beat the Arch Elder on my first playthrough. So mm -hmm. I was at that sticking point on stream where it's like, I don't want to beat my head against this sand wall any longer. And I just bailed and I haven't been back because in order to enjoy the extra content, I have to beat the Arch Elder first. And um, oh, I just, yeah, yeah. it's one of those points of pride where I can either, I can either do it on stream or I can just do it on my own. Either way, I have to do it before I can move on. Um, mm -hmm. I have played multiplayer since though, uh, actually once with um, X and, and Pixel Riffs and it was a blast and it was just brand new characters. Just three of us just kind of grabbed new folks and just kind of went through early, early levels. And I was surprised at how different it felt with, um, with three people. Cause I mm -hmm. played with Pixel Riffs before we did like a launch thing where we played together and uh, that was fun. But like with three people, it changes the dynamic entirely, um, especially when they're as fast as those guys are, because I was having trouble keeping up. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a really interesting experience. One thing that I have to be in the right mood for it, but I find that once I turn on Minecraft Dungeons, I'm really enjoying my time in it. I just don't often get there like you when I'm sitting down to stream or whatever. I'm usually thinking about whether I should be playing modded or whether I should be playing vanilla. <laughs> like that's kind of like mm -hmm. the initial toss up is those two. Yeah. I had a lot of fun doing it in the beginning and I a few times got playing up to four people and the chaos behind it. Cause usually, usually there's people dying pretty consistently in those it's just with how many monsters are there and if anybody's like woohoo i'm gonna be the hero and they run in first without really realizing it they get blown up by a creeper and then you get all the mobs spawning on top of it and the chaos element of it was always so fun to deal with and kind of figure out how to cope with that and for me because i was usually the stronger one i was like all right they all, all three of them died how can i save this and get them back alive mm -hmm. so it was it was fun i really enjoyed the game i thought it was a cool game I think for the dungeon crawler side of things, I'm always comparing things back to Diablo. Right. And that for me is just, it's hard to top that. It's, yeah. it, that was such, so many good memories of playing that game. So it's hard to compare to that one too much. Moving on to the email. This is the Chunk Mail Dispenser episode. So we'll be covering mostly email this week. Uh, and if you would like to email the show, the address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. That's the only email address we check. That's spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. 
First email comes from Dom S, a landscape artist member in our Discord chat, and it's about seasonal Minecraft. Hi, Joel and Stunt Johnny. I hope both of you had a great week. Recently, I had the idea to have some sort of seasonal mechanic in Minecraft. This could involve a cycle in the world much like the year in real life. You could then have a period of time in the cycle for a season to occur like summer, fall, winter, and spring. In my idea, the whole world would be affected by these seasons. For example, we would get colored leaves in the fall and they could fall to the ground. Snow in the winter with crop farming slowed down with frost and maybe even in spring, animals could breed quicker. This could be an optional thing or something you could stop with a beacon radius as I understand that changing the world due to weather could be controversial. Uh, I have recently become a patron and I love supporting the amazing show. I'm eager to hear what you both have to say on this topic. Thanks. Dom has left the game. Another unique sign off from one of our emailers. I always like, <laughs> these are always really funny. Um, but thanks so much for the email, Dom. Uh, I love the idea of seasons in Minecraft. Have you ever played any mods or any things, any situation where you have seasons? Whip? I have. And I think I'm going to be playing devil's advocate on this one, saying that mm. I, I'm not, I'm not quite there for the seasons in Minecraft aspect of it. I, but I'll, I'd like to hear your side of it first. <laughs> so I think technically the implementation would probably be restricted to just weather effects and maybe leaf colors changing. Uh, I don't think shedding leaves would perform very well. <laughs> As we mentioned earlier in the show, particles of falling leaves, I think, would break a lot of people's computers. <laughs> Harvesting leaves right now breaks computers. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think a color change would be fine. Um, also, trees in Minecraft without leaves are kind of sad looking stumps. They're not as ornate as, uh, as <laughs> trees are in real life without their leaves. And so I feel like, you know, keeping the leaves on the trees would probably be one of the restrictions there. Um, I like the idea of slowing crops. Instead of just saying you can't plant crops, just saying, well, during the season, your crops are going to go faster. Without it, they're going to grow slower. Similar to right now, you can plant wheat on tilled soil uh, with no water and it'll grow very slowly. Or if it's got hydrated soil, it'll grow faster. And I think that that's kind of a cool mechanic to, to think of. I think it's kind of a clever way to go about it. Um, I think though seasons would have to be short, much like the game day is only 20 minutes long from, you know, 10 minutes day, 10 minutes night. I feel like your seasons are going to have to be short as well for players to really get a feel for it. I don't think it would be a welcome, uh, seasonal shift if it was similar to, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that, um, not Farmville. What's the... What's the Nintendo, Stardew Valley? Star, no, what, no, not Stardew Valley. What's the one with um, Nintendo that, that's out right now? I can't believe I'm blanking. Oh, Animal this. Crossing. Animal Crossing. Duh. So Animal Crossing, the seasons in the Animal Crossing coalesce with seasons in real life. Um, and so, because that's a long-term, like, slow-paced game. I don't think mm -hmm. the majority of Minecraft players have the patience for that kind of thing. Uh, kind of a blanket statement, but I don't think I'm wrong. Uh, I, I could see, you know, seasons lasting an hour, maybe two hours. And I looked it up and I went looking for other uh, mods that might have this because I know I've seen it before uh, in a series that, that uh, Pixar Riffs played in. Uh, but Serene Scenes, which is part of the biomes of plenty, I'll have a link to the wiki here on the show notes. There are 12 seasons. So each of the four seasons has an early, a mid, and a late. So you'd have like early summer, mid summer, late summer. And then each sub season is eight in-game days long or a full year is 96 in-game days long. So you're dealing with like two and a half hours-ish to go through all four seasons in-game. I feel like that might be a little bit quick, but that's the only way that I could see this being something that I would enjoy. I would not want to be playing for days and days and days in winter. I have to deal with that in Canada already. <laughs> like I don't, I don't necessarily want that. Um, go online to be somewhere else <laughs> well that's the thing like one of the things i like about minecraft is that when it's you know there's two feet of snow outside i can log into a grassy meadow and everything's green and lush and bright and colorful uh i i think it would be cool and there are obviously there's cold biomes and there's desert biomes and stuff like that and i think that's that's mojang's solution for it is that the the biomes just have different temperatures to them uh i think what's lacking is there doesn't seem to be an in-between like we don't have the fall you know, mm -hmm. spring, you could argue that say like flower forests and birch forests are pretty springy, um, but they don't, we don't have fall colors in Minecraft, which is just too bad. Uh, it's always something. I mean, the first thing that I said when I saw pumpkin pastures in Minecraft dungeons was like, oh yes, 
<laughs> we need this in Minecraft so bad. <laughs> yeah, totally. So how do you yeah. feel about seasons? So for me, as I said, I was on the other side of this one. Seasons for me is something that I don't want to see in the game, and I've got a few reasons behind it. One is we already have the biome front for it. So if we wanted to add seasons, a lot of the biomes would have to be removed, or they'd have to have separate seasonal things for each of them, which I think would just slow the game down a lot. Of mm -hmm. like the snowy biomes, are they going to have three months out of the 12 months are going to be, or three out of the 12 seasons will have snow versus, or not have snow versus have snow, and then like, it's just a lot of additional calculations going on and anything that would affect player placed blocks that you can't control inside of the game outside of like creeper explosions or withers ender dragon all that stuff which is usually player influenced i don't think is good which is why i've always kind of i've been more on the side of don't bring any like disasters i know there's always been people who want to see like hurricanes or tornadoes spawn inside their minecraft world and there's mods for those and I would be so sad if one of those spawned and destroyed something I'd been working on for two months and there's nothing I could do to save it or control at all. Um, so that for me is a little bit more on the maybe not side. And then a big one that I see issues with is from the multiplayer side. Say you are a, you're a younger kid and your parents only give you like three hours of video game time a week. So every Thursday night you get to play for three hours. Right. Depending on the server that you're playing on, that three hours every single week might just be during the winter time, depending on how long the seasons last. So then you would only ever see Minecraft during winter time inside the game, which I always think is kind of a weird issue because then it always comes down to time of day is like, okay, hopping on the server at 2 a.m. is when I have to get there so I can be there for springtime so I can get my flowers to breed or get the bees out there and all that type of stuff. So I feel like seasons just overcomplicate things when it add like an unnecessary roughness around it, mostly for multiplayer gameplay. Single player gameplay, I could see it working. I don't think I would want to use it. I would love to instead like you already said we had the we have the snowy biomes we have the non-snowy biomes we have the spring ones with the flower forest and everything i would love to see a fall biome if we could have a fall biome that just had like orange and like reddish and yellowish leaves in there that for me would be the best thing ever like that that alone right there i would that's that's what i want <laughs> but i feel like the functionality of changing biomes based on like time of day and game or whatever is a little weird I agree. I think that biomes and the control over them would be kind of like the most quote unquote Minecrafty solution to this. And seeing what I've seen in all of Fabric 3 with all of those in between biomes, you know, like the the, the swampy forests and uh, the arid uh, or the not the arid deserts, but like the um, there's an in between one. There's one called the lush desert. So there's like cactuses and flowers and stuff, even though it's kind of like a sandy color. It's really, really mm -hmm. cool. And I think that, you know, adding in a fall biome or even in between fall biomes where you have like, well, maybe this one has got changed to the leaves. Maybe this one has got like a lot of leaves already on the ground. You could change grass textures. I think that does provide a lot more. Um, I also um, I can see your point about the in-game real life influencing things uh, i've played a number of games that are similar to minecraft like say no man's sky uh, where in-game farming is real time and is tied to the clock so if you're i can't i think they're called gravitino balls those are the first things i started farming they take eight hours real life in you know hours so if you just think well if i just log in in eight hours to harvest the gravitino balls and plant new ones then I can make some money in game. And then you've got a video game influencing how you schedule your real life. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I just, there's an inherent danger in that, especially when you've got, like you said, a parent that's trying to manage screen time for, for younger players. Um, so yeah, I, I like the idea of, of weather, but maybe not in the game. I like the idea of messing around with it in a mod, something that I'm not going to stick with for very long or something that I have a, a beginning, middle and an end to. Um, but uh, I, I think that the in-between there is, is, taking a lot of what happens in real world seasons and applying them to maybe static biomes in the game or maybe totally. give players control. Like we can we can put up a beacon. I think uh, Dom even mentioned in, in their email that they were talking about a, a, a beacon to stop it from happening if you didn't want it to happen. I would say, what if instead of a beacon to stop it, it was a new block or a new thing similar to uh, like the respawn anchor or something of that nature, where if you put it in a biome 
then that biome would get seasons, but it wouldn't affect anything else. You know, so that that could be a kind of a fun. That's kind of out there, but that's that could be a fun implementation. Moving on to the next email from Galwa, the uh, subject is the destructiveness of ghasts. Greetings, your rural chunkiness, Joel, and stunt picks. One reason I've never really wanted to build in the nether is because I'm not too keen on my structures or circuitry being destroyed by a stray ghast fireball, which are notoriously hard to avoid. In addition, the other destructive mobs are largely avoidable. Creepers won't spawn during the daytime, blazes only spawn near their spawners, and the withers won't spawn unless summoned. The ghast seems to be on the outlier of this uh, setup in this regard, and I personally don't want to spend the rest of my life placing slabs down to stop them spawning. Do you think ghasts are too unavoidably destructive? And if so, how would you go about improving this whilst still retaining the hostility of the nether? Some ideas I've had include being able to blast proof blocks and ghasts not being able to see you uh, if you hide in a group of piglins. I'm fairly new listener to the Spawn Chunks and a Patreon supporter. Thanks for the hours of entertainment these past few months. Uh, and I should mention that uh, Galwa is a community miner in our Discord. So thanks very much, Galwa, for the great email. Um, I know that you are dealing with perhaps seven ghasts currently floating around in your nether dig. I just feel like this was just picked out for me here, Joel. <laughs> I just, for some reason, this email just spoke to me a little bit. So, so whip your <laughs> thoughts on the destructiveness of ghasts. So right now I really appreciate them because I'm trying to destroy blocks. I am uh, trying to remove the nether. So they've actually, they've helped out a good amount. Uh, I will say I... I unfortunately my nether hub that I'm working on is in the middle of a soul sand valley like that is the central biome to all of it so there's gas everywhere uh so they're very very annoying and like it's annoying having to have an extra thing on the inventory of I always have to have a bow and an arrow inside my inventory so that I can shoot them back and get rid of them and then half the time they shoot one fireball and then they just despawn into nothingness and then I don't know where it came from and I've had one fireball that I hit back at a gas that I hit in the wrong direction and it accidentally hit my TNT flying machines that I have, and so then I had to rebuild those. And yeah, they're uh, they're not my best friends, to put it nicely. <laughs> um, but I think I think there needs to be like a vision radius on gas, or some sort of an enchantment, or like the way we have like the turtle helmet, which just kind of has its weird own thing to it. Those like a one-off turtle helmet. Maybe there's like a ghast helmet of sorts that you can craft out of gas tiers that like makes it so that they still fly around but then they either just don't see you or they're less likely to shoot at you the same way the warp fungi like draw draws away the hoglins or something like that i feel right. like there could be something cool in there that would be either something that you would build maybe like a small version of a beacon like you're saying unique blocks earlier something that just like makes them shoo away from the area just like go go away go do your own thing i don't want to bother you you don't bother me and then everything will be great and then they just kind of keep doing their thing speaking of which one actually just flew into my flying machine on my side monitor and knocked a minecart off yep there goes the <laughs> flying machine <laughs> that is weirdly perfect timing all oh, right man. then <laughs> well case case in point yeah I, i'm yeah, I'm, that's, I'm, uh... I'm with galwa as well uh i have all of my nether builds, my nether hub, and all of my nether tunnels. I mean, it's the reason why we're building tunnels in the nether is because it's safer if you build tunnels with slabs and stairs and glass floors, and they're only so high so that you don't have to worry about ghasts spawning in and blowing up your stuff. There are still a couple of spots inside the nether hub where a gas can spawn near the platform where our main portal is, but it happens so infrequently that we just kind of take the hit with it. They destroy a couple of blocks, we have to fix it, it's not a big deal. Uh, because there's so many different spawning spaces outside of the nether hub that they just more frequently spawn out there and it's never a big deal and they can't see through walls so you're you're fine there uh, but i think yeah i think something that has to be maybe an enchantment you know on an item uh or much like they did with the uh piglins that will ignore you if you're wearing gold uh yeah that would be it'd be so uh, some anyway yeah at all to avoid them and and oh, that's all and, we need and the trade-off there is that gold armor is pretty weak right like you go through it quicker it's not as sturdy as other stuff it doesn't protect you as much so the trade-off there is like you're going to be invisible to the piglins but you generally have to wear most players have decided that a helmet is the is the trade-off you know like while boots are cheaper safety helmet, yeah. yeah you need boots for the nether for like feather falling and it's just nicer to have more enchantments on the boots whereas your helmet 
you're like you don't really take knocks on the head that often so it, it's it's le- easier to keep a gold helmet around for longer uh, it would be interesting if it was something that would maybe fit in your chest slot so you might have to choose between elytra and repelling ghasts you know for the time you know being. i would take that you know I've, I've always been a big proponent of more unique things like yeah a, a backpack that you could equip instead of an elytra that yeah would just be like, able to store an extra like two rows of inventory yeah so if there was some way to like i'll just bring ender pearls back with me and just not have to deal with gas. I yeah. would take that. <laughs> like camp, like camo. You know, like if you if you had a chest plate made of chain mail, then the gas can't see you. I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of a spitballing here, but like we need a so, soul sand ghillie suit. <laughs> yeah, so, well, something like that would 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 be would make sense, right? Um, but I I agree that the gas stuff does get a little bit annoying, especially when, I mean, when you get outside of our nether hub, everything is just ugly cobblestone, because we just got so sick of rebuilding everything. If it doesn't have a roof on it, then it's just cobblestone because it's the only thing that they can't blow up, you know? Well, one of the only things. I should say the most, the easily obtainable uh, block that they can't blow up is is cobblestone. So a lot of our paths have been cobblestone since day one, <laughs> which is, it's, it's, and it's a three-year-old server. So we're kind of getting long in the tooth on that kind of stuff. But we're slowly building out the nether hub and the tunnels are slowly getting roofs on them. But it just becomes so much, it's a lot of building, you know, and you just start to get repetitive and things like that. Um, yeah. The only other thing I can think of would be to encourage uh, building in the nether would be to reduce or change the spawning conditions for a ghast uh, and have it be um, either limited to specific blocks. So like maybe it's only nether rack and soul sand. So that means that in a crimson forest, in a warp forest, or in a basalt delta, if you built your hub, then you'd be fine and just no ghasts would spawn ever. Not that they can't spawn next door, but like it would be a small sacrifice to say like if you had a decent build. Um, even better if it was maybe including soul sand and they just only spawn over netherrack. But again, that might be making it too easy. Like that might be pushing it too much the other way. Um, it's, I'm surprised actually, given all of the changes that they've made to the nether in the nether update, that similar to being able to turn fire tick off and, uh, other, I know that there are some data packs out there that it will say like, you know, no enderman griefing. Um, you can turn off creeper griefing, that kind of stuff. I'm kind of surprised that there's no kind of like accessibility setting for similar to fire tick where you could turn off ghast griefing because then it wouldn't matter. Right. If if there's stuff, if their stuff would still hurt you, but not your stuff, I wouldn't care as much. I don't care about being shot by a ghast. I care about the ghast shooting the thing that I just made. (laughs) That's well, I think uh, it always reminds me of there's this old comic. I used to follow. It's always Starcraft stuff. But it was like this little marine jumping in front of a giant battle cruiser as it's like taking this huge explosion that does like crazy damage to the battle cruisers, but not much. Anyway, side note. But anyway, if you jump into a gas fireball, it won't blow up the land around you. So I always find myself when I'm building something just being the human shield for my own build. I'm like, I feel like that's not the way it should function. I'm just like, I care. I would rather die in Minecraft then you blow up the thing that I just finished building. So I'm just going to jump right at the gas fireball. <laughs> yeah. We, and uh, that's what I've resorted to. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I hear you. Our, one of our first and one of our longest nether hub tunnels is all sandstone. And it's awesome where there's a roof. And then when there's no roof, it's riddled with holes. <laughs> like there's oh, just, God, I'm sure. Because, I mean, you you blink and a, and a, and a ghast uh, will, will destroy a sandstone pathway in, like, no time. Uh, our our mistake for building it at a sandstone. Yeah, I thought in Minecraft 1.16, they were supposed to turn the gas spawns down everywhere and then turn them up inside of Soul Sand Valley. But I feel like that turn down part just never happened. <laughs> right. Moving on into our third email from Dumblam4, Technic Launcher. Hey, Spawn Chunks. In the last episode, episode 105, I heard that Joel was having trouble with the Twitch Launcher. I use the Technic Launcher that I think would be better for Joel. It's super easy to get a mod pack. All you have to do is click on the install button and boom, done. You will have to sign in again and it will reset all of your settings. And if you search for fabric in uh, the uh, the search results, the second mod pack has fabric, phosphor, sodium, and lithium. And the pack is even set to 160 and 1. If that doesn't work for you, maybe some listeners might get some use out of it. Stay safe. Chunking out. Dumb Lamb 4. Another cool sign out. 
Uh, thanks very much for the info, uh, Denlam4. Uh, I haven't really given a lot of thought to the Technic launcher. Uh, I have already kind of committed to using the Twitch launcher because that's what was needed for all of Fabric for at least from a straightforward installation standpoint. Uh, I haven't used the Technic launcher, but since this is the second time that I've had a recommendation, I actually had someone write in anonymously to um, the Citadel Cafe and recommend the same thing uh, for different reasons, actually. Um, and I feel like it would just be the, the right thing to do to pass on the information to people that maybe want to try modded, maybe haven't already tried the Twitch launcher. I know that the Twitch launcher is supposed to be going away. Uh, so if you're interested in modded and you want to try the Technic launcher, it might be right for you. Um, to me, having not used it, just doing a little bit of research, and we'll have a link in the show notes, it looks like it just does the same thing as the Twitch launcher. Maybe it's just written better. I don't know. But I have no desire to reinstall a third version of Minecraft where I have to reset all my settings and do all those tweaks over again. So uh, I appreciate the tip and I'm happy to pass it on, but I think I'm kind of sticking with uh, the Twitch launcher for now. Uh, I don't really have much of a plan to try other modded in Fabric outside of all of Fabric 3. If I try another mod pack, I'm probably going to go try something on the Forge side of things. And I don't know what that might be yet. Um, I'm kind of up in the air about that. Maybe I'll try something like, you know, Sky Factory or something along those lines. Something more tech and quest focused, but I haven't decided yet. Either way, we'll have a link to uh, technicpack.net in the show notes where everyone can go and uh, and check this out if you're looking for a alternate uh, modded launcher for Minecraft. Last but not least, we have another email from Alpha Serium. Should Mojang develop mods and add-ons? And I've got a funny feeling that Whip might want to weigh in on this, given that he's playing on a modded server for the first time as well. <laughs> uh, hi, Johnny and Joel slash Whip. Uh, first off, I just want to say that I'm a huge fan of the podcast and soon to be patron. Well, thanks very much for considering that. That's awesome. Uh, my question to you is, should Mojang develop mods or add-ons with features that enhance Minecraft but wouldn't fit into the vanilla game? Many times in the community, the idea proposed to be added to the vanilla game, but is turned down for being un-Minecrafty, quote unquote. What if these features became mods? Now that Minecraft is actually helping Java mod and Bedrock add-ons developers by releasing parts of Minecraft's code and promoting add-ons in the marketplace, do you think Mojang should produce official mods and add-ons for Minecraft, Java, and Bedrock? These could be free or paid, priced like DLC for games, and would implement small additions to the vanilla game, which they would be not able to implement in the base game due to kickback from the community. Examples of these could be or include features of popular data packs or mods such as Exumavoid's vanilla tweaks packs, armor stand books, graves, multiplayer sleep, Optifine with connected textures and dynamic lighting, or Mr. Crayfish's furniture mod to add tables, chairs, and the like. Another more complicated example of, is autocrafting. Many high-level players do not dwell much on the early survival aspect of Minecraft, preferring to build mega bases, farms, and progress to the in-game quite quickly, instead of slowly grinding their way through there. Autocrafting may not fit into the base vanilla survival game, but could easily be implemented in a style that would fit Minecraft without needing to be a modded, quote-unquote, unofficial version of the game. I recently watched Mumbo Jumbo's video on a mod that added autocrafting in a very Minecrafty way, using locked and unlocked hoppers to feed and pull items from crafting tables. By the end of the video, he had made a very large contraption to produce a comparator from raw materials such as wood, quartz, redstone, and by crafting all the components needed to make a comparator and then crafting said comparator and outputting it into a chest. I believe the features such as this could easily be implemented into an official Minecraft add-on that could be then added to a Minecraft world similar to data packs. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think Mojang should add small add-ons almost like DLC to Minecraft? Or would these not be useful and not have any advantage or already released mods by the Minecraft community? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Logging off, Alpha Serium. Thanks for the great email. Any thoughts on Minecraft making mods whip so i you could correct me if i'm wrong here but there was a mine con mine whatever they call them nowadays uh the one three years ago whatever that was named uh, the live show where they actually showed off a bedrock developer had made a grapple mod like where you could have a grappling hook that you'd like shoot out and then it would create like a bridge out of oak slabs after it landed or whatever it was and I always thought that was a cool idea. 
And then I remember they talked about it further being more along the lines of once it got implemented, if they did implement it, put it on the store, etc. They were then in charge of making sure it never conflicted with anything moving forwards. Same reason why when you update your Minecraft, like your forge can sometimes like it breaks every time and all the mods need to be re-updated because there's just those little changes to it. So I would worry that it might force Minecraft to make certain changes being like, oh, we spent all the time developing these things and we can't keep them updated or we're, we can't update the game in this certain way for the official update because we did this, this and this over here. So I think it'd be cool to have some things built into the core game, like the Optifine stuff, but I don't know about like the official supported data packs. I feel like there's already a pretty healthy community around that of Minecraft basically has people developing re free stuff for them that works as that DLC. Cause it's, we can host modded servers, obviously as I've been playing on one, it's possible to host a modded server. I think you can also host servers on bedrock that have data packs installed, which then community members can create those that can do pretty much anything. I think they mentioned in the email, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not incredibly up to date on how the, the not data packs, what are they called? They're, um, Oh, they're, they're like not modifications. They're 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 part of the store. Add-ins, um, add-ons, add-ons. I think they're add-ons um, for Bedrock because they function similar to data packs, but then you can like purchase them on on the Minecraft. Mm -hmm. um, and they can add the extra animals. Store, and yeah, like that, and that kind of thing. And for me, like I'm on the same vein. Like I think it's a delicate line to walk. On one hand, mods developed by the Minecraft team would we hope work and be easier to implement than the existing mods. You know, case in point, my example and my experience with uh, Fabric and all of Fabric 3 and things not working right. Um, so that would be good if, you know, Mojang was keeping them all up to date, uh, which they would then be required to do. Uh, on the other side, if Mojang made an Optifine-like mod, what then happens to Optifine? Mm -hmm. What's the PR fallout of... Uh, a Minecraft creator making a new animal mob and putting it up in the Minecraft store only to have Mojang decide that they want to add that mob to the game via their own. Well, mod. that that has actually happened in the past. Mojang's done a good job about bringing that in, but the horse model that we used was actually done through a, somebody created as a mod that added horses into the game. And then Mojang was like, that's really cool. And they actually bought it off that person, I believe. Right. Um, and then also on top of that, as far as the Optifine stuff goes, they did try reaching out to the Optifine developer, Svax, I believe their name is. Uh, I could be wrong there. But they ended up saying no because of how Minecraft wanted to limit and change things and how Optifine was running. And the guy was just like, no, it wouldn't run the same. This isn't Optifine, so I don't want to do it. Right. Uh, so I like there's community members right there being like, we just kind of acknowledging that they don't want to go the Minecrafty route, which I think is, I think is healthy. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that they did with data packs. I think that data packs are kind of your middle of the road answer to instead of Mojang making mods, they're instead making it easier for people to make mods uh, mm -hmm. or, or augment the game or tweak the game. Cause I mean, data packs, while technically uh, are mods, I don't think that they open up enough of the game to say it's really modded uh, in the fact that you don't need a different launcher. You don't need an instance of Minecraft specifically for modded. You don't need a, an older version. You can run data packs on 16.3 right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that effort on Mojang's part really does help um, balance out the developer community and make things a little bit easier. Like for example, I don't know how to code in Java. I don't know how to do any of that, but I'm able to pop onto somebody's website that's made a tool and create any custom recipe I want. You know, rotten flesh leather. I can. I, I was toying around with one that I haven't implemented yet, but it was breaking down diamond tools that you find when you're doing end rating into their core elements of sticks and diamonds. Because I don't want this oh. weird enchantment, you know, because <laughs> sometimes they already <laughs> have enchantments on them that you just don't care about. Uh, but it's like, hey, I'd really like these diamonds. Um, and it's not like you're farming diamonds because it's it's still a finite number of, you know, um, end cities to raid. Um, so stuff like that I thought would be kind of interesting and useful. Uh, we've seen other, um, they mentioned um, vanilla tweaks. You've seen vanilla tweaks implement things like being able to craft horse armor, 
right? So stuff like that is such an easy add-on now to the point where I've got some vanilla tweaks and some of my own custom data packs on the Citadel that I forget are data packs uh, because they're just, they're part of my vanilla game experience and they don't feel like they've left that realm because data packs don't allow so much access that you can create things that are like really um, un Minecrafty. You can create mm -hmm. silly recipes that break the game, but then, then it just becomes no fun. Like then you might as well just, you know, playing creative. Mode. Yeah, the dirt to diamonds recipe that yeah, some people do. Exactly. Like that, that kind of stuff was a little bit OP. Well, I say a little bit, it's enormously OP. But it also just takes <laughs> that's just the 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 honesty of the player, right? Like that just kind of relies on, you know, things. But one of the spirits I think of Minecraft is play how you want to play. And so by, you know, Mo Mojang making mods, they're saying, here's our base game. We think this is how it should be played but also you can play it this way, but also you can play it this way. And this is how we think you should play when you're not playing it the way that we designed. And so it becomes this mixed message. And, and it's better, I think, when you have the community being able to do these mods and being able to make these data packs. And I think what will end up happening is like you mentioned, is that if, if there is an implementation of say this auto crafting thing, now I'm using this as an example, I'm not saying that Mojang is gonna add auto crafting to the game. But if there's something of that quality that then just surfaces and everyone's talking about it, then there's a chance it could influence either in whole or in part some new feature, you know, that's, that gets added to, added to Minecraft. And so I think that one of the reasons that they don't develop mods is because it would kind of pull the rug out from an otherwise robust community of thinkers. Like Mojang has this amazing community where if they're stuck for ideas, which I don't think they are, then they need to not look any farther than their front doorstep because there are just mm -hmm. tons of people pushing up their glasses going like, well, that's not how I would do it, you know? And sooner or later, one of those spaghetti noodles might spark something at, at, at Minecraft, right? Yeah, totally. And even just the note of like the developers would actually have to take the time to create these things. And it's just like, well, we're going to spend time focusing on things that aren't part of the game instead of part of the game. So... Developers are already strapped for time as is between reading feedback and everything. It'd be, I, I, yeah. I kind of prefer if they focus on actual features for the game. The, the one thing that I, I would say that I, I would like to see is providing some sort of guideline. Now, whether that's Mojang providing it or whether that's the community around modded providing it. Something that I found frustrating when learning about mods and trying to load them and trying to figure out which ones I wanted to use uh, with fabric specifically, because it's the only experience I have, is just how broad the idea of a mod is. Uh, mm -hmm. The mod author for the mod pack is choosing these specific mods because they work together, they've done the research that they don't conflict, but then there's no real, I guess, um, quality assurance because some mods are like, well, this is just either dumb or really doesn't work the way that I thought it would. And uh, then I'm stuck with it in the pack, you know? And I mean, I guess I could remove it, but like, it's one of those things where I'd like to see more consistency. I'd like to see more uh, ease of use for modded because I think that there's probably a gate there. And if the gate could be open a little bit more or made e more easily accessible, I'd love to be able to develop mods, but I can't code. So if, if there, there's tools out there, you know, if, if Mojang was going to put any energy into something that's not Minecraft, that was in the modded realm, I'd rather have them spend the energy as they have done in providing more information to the modded community to make modding something that more people can get involved in because then you're just going to get the cream of the crop rising to the top, right? Uh, totally. Yeah. I think that's probably the, the best way to go. Well, that is going to be it for this episode of The Spawn Chunks. You can find out more information about the show and links to some of the things that we talked about at thespawnchunks.com. Music for the show was composed by Pixel Riffs. The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you get value out of the show, why not consider putting a little bit of value back in? Visit patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join the community. We're pledging at any level. We'll get you an invite to the Patreon-only Discord chat access to the bonus audio and get us closer to our next goal, which is a monthly Minecraft audio hangout where we just kind of do this, but with some of you. Uh, currently, we are at 208 patrons holding steady from last week. And I want to give a special shout out to our content engineers, Cameron Segelski, Dilkin Sebin, Greener Canuck, JD Williamson, and Yitz for supporting this episode. 
You can spread the word about the podcast by just poking a friend in the arm and saying, hey, you should listen to this. It's very easy to find. Just tell them where they can listen to it. It's one of the best ways that the show can find new listeners. Beyond that, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at The Spawn Chunks. And of course, you can subscribe for free on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. The email for the show is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com and the RSS feed can be found on the spawnchunks.com. And the Patreon-only RSS feed can be found on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to The Render Distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Joel Duggan. Everything that I'm doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. The Citadel Cafe is a podcast I do about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment, recording early this week with Megan tomorrow, ahead of the hurricane heading my way. And of course, you can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media. Today, I will point you towards twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan, where I built a very cool bridge, I think. Whip approved <laughs> uh, on the <laughs> Citadel this weekend. Go check that out at twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan to whip Sir, where can people find what you're doing online? So everything I'm doing right now is over on YouTube. Uh, just FWIP on there or on Twitch is FWIP as well. And everything over there I've been doing is just Minecraft recently or jumping into Among Us and murdering all my friends in space. It's been it's been great. Yeah, <laughs> lots of entertainment happening over there. So be sure to check that out as well. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite and modded. <laughs>